This is um, a Nepal project uh, called Anukulan, which was part of the Global Braced uh, uh, Program. Uh, the Global Braced Program was building resilience and adaptation to climate extremes and disasters. Um, I won't be talking too much about the program or the project today because I really want to use this to frame questions of resilience. Um, but uh, you have my email address here if you have any questions about the um, project uh, or about the study that I will be talking about. So uh, the Anukulan project, specifically here in Nepal, uh, was implemented by a fairly large consortium, 11 different partners led by IDE uh, over a four-year period and reaching 120,000 households. The concept of resilience that was promoted by the BRACED program was using the three A's framework. We spoke about resilience quite a bit yesterday. Well, yesterday's conversation was, was excellent and also somewhat theoretical, and I think we got a good view of the, the number of different kinds of framings uh, that we can have around resilience. Um, this is one particular version of it, uh, adaptive, anticipatory, and absorptive capacity. So thinking about that in terms of uh, communities, for example, anticipating and absorbing shocks and stresses while then adapting to, to reduce the impact, uh, uh, sorry, the uh, impact of future events. Um, so uh, uh, transformative is another version of, uh, of resilience that we've heard in this context, but it didn't fit into the braced three A's framework. Um, this, uh, this work that I'll be discussing now, and don't worry, since we have a short time, I won't go into great detail on this study, uh, but uh, it will be based on a third-party study that was done on this Anukulan braced project, and in particular, the agriculture and marketing interventions. They were seen to be very successful in general uh, through the program evaluation, and so the braced program wanted to see, okay, what was most successful with this? Uh, why was it successful? What are some of the enabling factors and some of the barriers, and how, we, how can we replicate this across other country programs. Um, so I won't go into great detail on this study. Um, I will speak mostly about this part, the proof of concept piece. So the, uh, the first part of the study was, as I was saying, really thinking about uh, was it successful and why was it successful. The study was of this, um, this concept, this package of agriculture and marketing interventions that's been promoted by IDE uh, for several years now, um, developed initially under the ICCA project under USAID and then replicated later under, under Anukulan. And this package of interventions, what IDE calls the commercial pocket approach, is, uh, is, uh, really has four core components. It begins with uh, farmer organization. Uh, organizing farmers enables a lot of other kinds of interventions, everything from market linkage, coordination of production, so that you can get higher prices at market, um, uh, as well as providing a vehicle for additional training uh, later on. Um, uh, second, establishment of some kind of a collection center. We've seen many types of collection centers around Nepal. The thing that I think distinguishes this is actually the management committee. It is a marketing and planning committee that has a, uh, a strong hand on management of that collection center and coordination of the farmer groups that produce for the collection center. And then, of course, technical advice and capacity building. And also, another key component here is extension of input supply chains and technical services. Uh, what we've seen in much of Nepal is that there's a very weak private sector uh, reaching the poorest and the most marginal households. And so if you want to be able to reach them for agriculture, you have to make sure they're getting high quality seeds, for example. And in drought prone areas, that might also include drip irrigation kits and, uh, and other kinds of uh, sustainable inputs. Uh, the project was in uh, six districts in the Midwest and Far West, mostly in the low hills in Tarai, or low to mid hills in Tarai, Kanchanpur, Kailali, Bardia, Dadeldura, Doti, and Surkat. Um, I'm going to skip directly to the results. I think the first big result of this study, uh, and I will say this study had both qualitative and quantitative components, and then a final qualitative component where we went back to the field, interviewed uh, some of the key informants who we'd, who we'd begun this study with, and relayed some of the initial results, and then got reactions, learned more, asked more questions. It was, um, uh, it was quite an extensive study and actually very enlightening in terms of some of the motivations and 
the enabling factors uh, behind the successes. So first of all, I think the first uh, result did not really surprise anyone uh, who had been involved in the evaluation of the project initially. It was successful. It was successful at meeting its core objectives, particularly in terms of, in terms of income generation. What did surprise us was that the income generation was actually higher for total household income than for agricultural in income. In other words, the treatment effect was, was greater than what we, were, what we were hoping to do with the project. And what we determined through some of this qualitative work was that there was a strong empowerment effect happening as a part of this. It was particularly strong for women, and this was something that we were very excited to see because, of course, we all want to be empowering women, and there are very few studies that really uh, have, have been very good at identifying how specifically to do that in the rural Nepal context. Um, and what we saw was that there was this confluence of factors, increased confidence, increased knowledge, increased uh, decision-making power by the women uh, over earned income, all of which was extremely important. Um, also increased access to cash for uh, household and educational expenses. In other words, integrating women directly into markets and working with women as market actors enabled them to have more immediate cash rather than just waiting, for example, for remittances uh, from, their, from their husbands who are migrating. Um, these, uh, these effects had a, seemed to build upon themselves. Um, and so uh, on the right, I don't know how well you can see, but we have four elements that seemed to be making this, uh, this positive feedback loop. Confidence, income, knowledge, and capacity. Now, if you think about this in, in fra framing as a traditional capacity building model, you might start on the bottom, that knowledge piece. Increase knowledge increases people's capacity, might increase their confidence, and then they can gain some income from that. But we found, interestingly, that, that, that you, you could start there, but that the income piece was also extremely important, that in areas where they did not see immediate returns uh, on investment, and investment in this case meant their own personal capital, their time, their land, their, their, uh, their um, agricultural labor, if, if households did not see an immediate return, very often they would drop the project, that they really, in the areas that were most successful, they saw a quick return, that income was a strong reinforcer that this was something that was worth doing. So an important piece to keep in mind for, for future programming, I think, uh, in this area. If income is your goal, then make sure that you're actually making that very visible and demonstrate that quickly. But also, another really important piece of this was a shared experience. Um, the shared experience seemed to reinforce group cohesion, and this was cohesion not only within a farmer group, for example, but also between farmer groups. Very often, farmer groups might be of a single ethnic group or, or caste. Um, they might be only women, for example. But this social cohesion was, was increased for the programmatic areas as a whole. So when you have a collection center with maybe 20 different production groups that are producing for the collection center. If you're approaching it as a, um, what I like to think of as a strong social technology, then that, that program can actually uh, create better social cohesion uh, across different uh, traditionally somewhat complicated relationships. So connecting the women farmer groups to the men's farmer groups, connecting uh, Dalit farmer groups to Bahum farmer groups, for example, and, um, and creating social cohesion overall. Um, and of course, we did find that the different results emerged in, uh, in different contexts. I think there several big takeaways um, can have a, uh, se several different aspects of this can be takeaways that we can apply to this concept of resilience as a whole. Some themes that emerged from this is that we need to be thinking about resilience in terms of individual resilience, as well as household resilience, as well as community resilience. So you may have an individual within a household who's particularly vulnerable, even in a household that itself is not particularly vulnerable. Um, Again, to many of us who have been working on this programmatically for some time, these may be relatively, relatively obvious pieces, and yet they seem to fall through the cracks sometimes, both in the program, programming from the donor side and also from the, from the field implementation piece. And this vulnerability really has to be reflected in several, across several different domains, knowledge and capacity, uh, infrastructure, not just the infrastructure, but also the management of that infrastructure, and finally, um, enabling policies. So thinking 
thinking, thinking really about what are the policies that will enable this kind of, uh, kind of cohesion and reduced vulnerability. And finally, thinking about this as systems. Uh, so thinking about the various components that need to make up a system. Uh, we did find, for example, that in this study, you can't take out any of those four core components or the entire system fails. So those four components of the agricultural and marketing intervention are really required and they must be well integrated in order to have the kind of successes that we saw in this project. Uh, so if you think about it in terms of systems, that also begs the question of sequencing. So if you have a large system, where do you intervene first? Where do you intervene strongest? Or do you have to intervene within the system as a whole? Uh, then of course, um, thinking about that question of social networks and social co cohesion. And finally, thinking in terms of barriers to behavior change. So things like, well, we didn't see an immediate return on our investment, so we're not going to be adopting this program after after all. Um, so just thinking in broad terms, uh, I, uh, I just wanted to sort of open the discussion in, in these terms.